and that's been driven primarily by the mining industry. So um, a lot of a lot of uh, mineral, a lot of mines, new mines opening up up north, mostly iron and gold. There's been a few other ones as well, as well as some gas and oil exploration. So there's a lot of development going up north. That attracted a lot of uh, young people to Perth. Well, attracted a lot of people to Perth, but a lot of uh, young families came to Perth. And um, young young people looking to go up north, work away up north, make some money, and, uh, and uh, build a bit of a dream. And a lot of those people have actually invested in uh, apartments in the city, these young families, or young couples. Also a lot of young single men. Perth did have a an excess of male to female ratio for a while there. Unlike Sydney, Sydney apparently has more females than males. Mm -hmm. I would think so. So yeah, the, uh, the it was kind of the opposite here, and that was because of the industries that, were, that people were attracted to. That doesn't mean they live in Perth all the time. A lot of these young men are, and women, there are women definitely working in the industry. They go up north, work way up north, and. Um, do two weeks on and have one week off, or four weeks on, one week off. And by doing that, they, um, they earn very good money and they don't have anywhere to spend it. So when they come to back to the city, they've got a bit of excess cash in their pockets. So uh, the smart ones tend to buy a bit of property and the other ones buy jet skis and motorbikes and all the other big boys' toys, big girls' toys. Um, but you can see along here quite a few newer, newer apartments that have sprung up in the last 10 years and are still back, back going up. Now the interesting thing is the actual construction phase of the mining uh, boom has, has finished. So it takes about 5,000 people to build the mine site. But that only takes maybe between 500 and 1,000 people to run it. So um, that means that and the workforce shrinks down to about 20% of its original uh, site. So, um, so what that means, a lot of people, a lot of the hotels in Perth would actually put, a lot of miners were staying in hotels on their weeks off because it was actually a shortage of accommodation in Perth. Um, now they've actually built new hotels as well. And that means that uh, in the next five years, they believe that for tourism, that's a really good thing because we now have too many hotel rooms and the prices will come down a little bit. So over the next five years, we're expecting that our, our uh, the prices of our motel, hotel rooms will actually come down a little bit and making Perth a more attractive destination for more tourists to come here. But then again, they're building that six-star hotel, which is going to cost around about fifteen hundred dollars a night to stay there. So, so uh, obviously, not everybody's going to be worried about how much it costs to stay. Yeah. Still got the Swan River on our left-hand side, and we're going to be following that along as we head out to Perth here. Yeah. So we only got a couple of Australians on board, so um, so I'm guessing everyone else is from different parts of the world. And uh, can anybody tell me who discovered Australia? Anyone want to have a guess? Some people might say Captain Cook. Some people might say uh, the Dutch. They were here about 200 years before Captain Cook. But uh, there are other people that say, well, probably the Aboriginals. They've been here around about 60,000 years. So they may have discovered it slightly before Captain Cook or the Dutch. So um, there are over 700 different Aboriginal groups across Australia. So uh, if I'm talking about Aboriginal people, I'm kind of generalising. But there are lots and lots of different little Aboriginal countries within Australia. And we're actually within a language group at the moment is Noongar. 
Uh, Noongar is the Southwest language, and that's an overall language. And then in that language group, it's broken up to dialects like Bibbulmun and others in this area. If we go further north, around Geraldton to Carnarvon, you've got Yamaji. Keep going further north still into the Pilbara. You've got quite a lot more language groups all the way up to uh, around Broome. You've got the, um, the language groups of the Bardi and the, the, the saltwater people up there. Does it vary greatly? You know, it does it? vary greatly. Um, the difference of language spoken between, say, Sydney and Perth, um, if they were speaking their original dialects, which they both, a lot of them don't because those languages have been lost. But the language differences between one side of the country and the other are as different as Swahili and, and Hindi. Oh. So there's quite a big difference in, in languages. So um, yeah, very, very big differences. There are, there are, like in the Noongar language group um, in the southwest, you've probably got another 10 or 15 dialects in that area. But when you go north um, into like Central Australia, um, you've got uh, the Jaro languages, the Western Desert languages, which is Bit Jada Yanka Jada Nakandara. Now those languages there are related and they understand one another. A little bit like in the Germanic language group, you've got um, you know, different dialects of German. And then if you go out of that, you've got German, Swiss German. Yes. And then if you go to things like um, Dutch is a Germanic language, English is a Germanic language, so is Norwegian, uh, Swedish and um, Danish. So they're all Germanic languages. Um, but of course, German to English is quite a big difference. But it, is, uh, it has a root in the Germanic. So within Australia, different Aboriginal people didn't all understand each other, so, um, but they usually understood the languages of their neighbours. So they learned the languages of their neighbours. So where we go to in Norcia today, um, there'll be a language group that lived in that area. But when we go through, say through to Cervantes, um, we're on the coast, the language group there would have been different to New Norcia. So they would have spoken a different language, or a different dialect at least. So, as I said, we had our Aboriginal people occupying the country for around 60,000 years. Now, it's believed that we had visitors from the north for that last six to 800 years, and that was the Malays, the Malacan, um, and uh, Indonesian fishermen who would trade with the Aboriginal people along the coast. Um, and there is evidence, genetic evidence, that uh, Aboriginal people went back to, uh, to parts of Indonesia, Malaysia, um, and actually was on the islands there um, with the fishermen and, and essentially intermarrying. Um, we do know that uh, the first Europeans to sight Australia were the first re registered Europeans to sight Australia were the Dutch. The Portuguese are rumoured to have been here before um, and there is some maps that suggest they did map part of the coastline. However, the first recorded landing was by William Jansen in uh, the Dufkin, the Little Dove, uh, on the top of Queensland in 1606. It wasn't until the uh, until the, uh, a few years later that uh, they started to map the western coast of Australia. So the Dutch were basically in on the Spice Islands, which is what we call Jakarta, Indonesia. That's what the Dutch used to call that, the Spice Islands. And they had a large colonies there um, and traded very heavily with the Indonesians and the people of that region. They, um, they mapped the western coast. You had people like Fleming sailing into the, into the uh, Swan River. And, uh, so, sorry, not sailing, sailing along and seeing the Swan River um, and sailing up and down the west coast and then the VOC, the Dutch East India Company, trading um, from Indonesia through to Africa, through to, uh, to England and, and also to America. They were, they were traveling along our coast for about 200 years. They did make landfall in several places, but they found that the Aboriginal people were not, um, 
were not easy to trade with and they didn't have anything that the Dutch considered to be of value. So they never bothered to actually claim the western half of Australia. But they did name it and they named it New Holland. Now any old maps of Australia pre about uh, pre about the middle 1800s always named the western half of the country as New Holland. Now um, it wasn't until 1829 when the English actually put a colony on uh, on the Swan River that uh, that it became the western part. Now, of course, Captain Cook had arrived in 18 uh, in 1770 on the east coast, sailed along the east coast, and named a lot of the uh, the eastern part of Australia, mapped a lot of the eastern part of Australia. Now, Following him, the French had come almost immediately after him, and they also surveyed part of the Australian coast, um, going down to Tasmania and across the bottom. Uh, then you had, so you had a collection of different maps from the Dutch, the French, and the English all put together, and that kind of gave us a rough outline of what Australia was. But the first full mapping of Australia was carried out by two men, um, two different explorers with a shipload of people as well, but um, were several ships. That was Matthew Flinders, the Englishman, and um, and Nicolas Baudin, the, uh, the Frenchman. Now, those two actually sailed around Australia on two different expeditions at the same time, and that was in 1802. And they so they mapped Australia, and that's how he got the uh, the outline of Australia. <coughs> they then took the, um, and it was Matthew Flinders who was credited with giving the name, coining the name Australia. And that came from Terra Australis Incognito, which was the unknown Southland. So that was the original uh, Latin, Terra Australis Incognito. And he took that, the name Australia from that. All right, so we're heading out towards Guildford. So we've, uh, we've turned off the Great Eastern Highway now, down on Guildford Road, heading out towards, um, well, this is still the original Great Eastern Highway, sorry. Uh, that was the, the bypass that we take a lot these days, most people do. And we'll be coming down to, uh, to a, a, a sharp right next to an old hotel that was um, burnt down about 10 years ago. And uh, the Guildford Hotel and a lot of uh, fights between the developer of the site and the, uh, the government. It did burn down under mysterious circumstances, allegedly. Um, apparently it was heritage listed. And so uh, yeah. there was a convenient fire, but it wasn't convenient enough because the front of it was still standing. So he was made to, uh, to keep the facade. Some beautiful old houses out here. Um, a lot of new ones, unfortunately, a lot of the oldest houses got knocked down here. This Guildford would say in the Swan Valley was um, was a little settlement outside of Perth and part of our first agricultural areas here in Western Australia. What do we grow in Western Australia? We grow um, well, pretty much everything. Um, we, we, we grow yeah, in the in the southwest region. We grow wheat, oats, barley, lupins, canola, um, all the grains, all the grain crops. We don't really grow corn, so or maize. We don't we don't really grow that down here. That's more growing up up north. Um, 
and in uh, tropical regions, so uh, we go Carnarvon and up around Broome, you've got uh, Kununurra. We have all our tropical regions where we, all our tropical fruits are growing, bananas, pawpaws and mangoes, all your tropical fruits. So we do have the different climatic regions. Western Australia is around 2 million square kilometres, so it's actually a third of the whole of Australia. So it's, um, it's a very, very large area to grow things in. Uh, Western Australia could be self-supporting. Um, we have almost every mineral known to man as well in, Australia, in Western Australia. The only mineral that's not found in Australia is chromium, I believe. And chromium is only found in Africa. But uh, every other mineral, so gold, silver, copper, nickel, zinc, um, a lot of your different mineral sands they used to make computer parts out of, um, your silicons, your, um, your iron ore, coal, gas, oil. Uh, West Australia could be independent. In fact, in 1932, there was a referendum in West Australia to succeed for the rest of Australia. Uh, because they had a bit of an argument with the East Coast over funding. Well, it, back, back when um, when Federation occurred, back in the in uh, just before 1900, when they were when they were putting Australia together, shall we say, uh, Western Australia almost didn't join. Um, and in fact, it was New Zealand who almost did join, which would have made it a, a lot different, I think. So, but uh, Western Australia almost became a separate country then. But they did, they did end up staying, and um, yeah, and so we have, you know, have this. So this is Guildford, this is the, um, the more of the historical part of Guildford through here. It's a beautiful old building, it's built by Complex, I believe. A lot of this, uh, a lot of the older buildings here. So the bricks were, uh, were built by the Comics. She used to make the bricks, they had the, the brickworks. Um, they've had some nice clays between here and Perth. They fired their own bricks. So you can see some of the more historical buildings. And just up the road here we have Guildford Grammar, which is uh, just behind these buildings. One of the uh, early, oldest schools in Perth. The science Boys. More about the design, something. So it's Federation style here, you saw here. This is around the early 1900s, late 1800s. So crossing the swan again. As you can see, it's getting narrower and narrower. Disturbed last time, maybe it's because I'm sitting. Hold on. Uh, it's going to be a pain. Look, just I'll do it as quick as I can. Just uh, 